welcome everybody welcome to this chapter 16 where we talk about price levels and the exchange rate in the long run we have uh, four different topics in this chapter i would like to talk about the law of one price absolute purchasing power parity as well as relative purchasing power parity and then in the end about the big mac index in the part 16.3 relative purchasing power parity I'll also come up with a regression analysis to test this theory. Purchasing power parity is one of the oldest exchange rate theory. The objective of this theory is to explain the exchange rate level based on the domestic and the foreign goods price level or to explain changes in the exchange rate by the inflation differential the inflation rate in the domestic economy and the inflation rate in the foreign economy. Let's start with the first concept, the law of one price. Let's have a look at these assumptions. So if we assume free trade, no transaction costs, complete transparency for all agents, and when we assume that the goods are homogeneous, Goods are homogeneous in case that there are no geographical preferences, no preferences in time, no personal preferences. And in case that goods are the same or have the same characteristics, then the price in all markets have to be the same. The law of one price will hold. In equation one, we have formalized this relationship. So the good price in the home market is indicated by P. Uh, the goods price in the foreign market is abbreviated by P star and the exchange rate is given by E. So in case that all these assumptions are fulfilled, then it has to be the case that the goods price in the domestic economy is equal to the goods price in the foreign economy after consideration of the exchange rate. In case that this equation does not hold and the larger or smaller sign is valid, arbitrageurs will enter the market. Let's come up with a numerical example. Let's assume that the exchange rate is at the level of 0.8 euros for one dollar. The price in Germany is equal to five euros and the price in the US is equal to 10 US dollars. The price in the US after consideration of the exchange rate is equal to 0.8 times 10, it's equal to 8 euros. So the German product only costs 5 euros, while the American counterpart costs 8 euros. And therefore, it is the case that the product in the US is expensive, the product in Germany is uh, cheap. So in case that you want to profit from this situation, buy low, sell high, buy in Germany and sell in the US. So arbitrageurs, they perform this uh, kind of deal that they buy low and they sell high. In the first step, arbitrageurs have to sell dollars and have to buy euros because they want to go shopping in Germany. So the demand for euros is high, the supply of dollars is also high. Afterwards, they buy the cheap German product and they sell this product in the US goods market at a higher price. The profit per deal will be equal to the price difference. The profit per deal will be equal to three euros. But uh, due to the fact that the arbitrageurs are exchanging dollars into euros, we have an increase in the supply of dollars and therefore there is a tendency that the exchange rate will decrease, which implies an appreciation of the euro. The demand for German products will increase. This gives upward pressure on the um, domestic goods price and the supply of American products increases, which leads to downward pressure on the American goods price. So this um, arbitrage opportunity will stop in case that the German price increased from, let's say, 
5 euros to the level of 6.3 euros. The exchange rate decreased from 0.8 to 0.7 and the American goods price decreased from 10 to 9. In case that this relationship holds, then once more the law of one price holds and there is no arbitrage opportunity anymore. In case that transaction costs play a role, of course, it will be the case that the law of one price will not hold due to these arbitrage opportunities because of the fact that arbitrage will um, be eliminate, eliminate, eliminated when the price differential is equal to uh, the transaction costs. So let's assume that we have transportation costs of one euro for shipping, for example, and hence arbitrage will only take place when the price differential is larger than the transaction costs. This is the case in our example because we assumed in the beginning that uh, the price in Germany is equal to five euros, the price in the US is equal to eight, so that the price differential is equal to three and hence larger than the transaction costs. Uh, so in the beginning, arbitrage will also take place because the price differential is larger than the transaction costs, but then the price adjustment will stop when the price differential is equal to one euro. So, for example, the price in Germany will not increase all the way from the level of 5 to the level of 6.3 euros, but only to 5.9. The exchange rate will not decrease all the way down from 0.8 to 0.7, but this adjustment will stop at 0.75 and the American goods price will not decrease from 10 to 9, but maybe only to 9.2. So that in the end, there is still a differential between the goods price in Germany and the goods price in the end, but these, uh, this differential only reflects the transportation costs. In case that you wonder where these numerical values stem from, it is just a numerical example uh, to illustrate this kind of concept. And you cannot exactly compute how much um, adjustment will take via the two goods prices and how much adjustment will take via, uh, will be taken by the nominal exchange rate. Uh, this is not possible to uh, compute uh, based on these assumptions here. Only the tendency should be clear. When it comes to the concept of absolute purchasing power parity, we do not talk about the goods price of a special good anymore, but we talk about the price for a basket of goods. So now we compare a basket of goods in um, Euroland and we compare it with the price of a basket of goods in the US. What is a basket of good? You can regard like a shopping cart as a basket of goods. So you go shopping in a German supermarket and you buy three bottles of milk at the price of five euros, four, four units of sausage at the price of 2.5, five pieces of cheese at the price of one, uh, 10 cans of beer at the price of 4 and 2 small bottles of Jägermeister at the price of 15. In the end, you go to the counter and the person at the counter says, um, this basket of goods costs 100 euros. Then you perform the same experiment also in, U in the US. You also construct a basket of goods consisting out of the same volume of products and then of course you are paying the American price, the price in US dollars in the American supermarket and in the end the person at the counter will say oh this basket of goods costs 125 dollars. 
The equilibrium exchange rate according to absolute purchasing power parity in this example is like the price of the basket of goods in Germany divided by the price of the basket of goods in the US. So the equilibrium exchange rate according to absolute purchasing power parity is 0.8 euros per dollar. So um, the equilibrium exchange rate is equal to 0.8 euros. Um, let's assume that the actual exchange rate is indeed equal to 0.8 euros per dollar. When you go back to this kind of shopping list and you check whether the law of one price holds or the law of one price does not hold for each and every good, then you will recognize that the law of one price only holds for one item for product number four, for beer, but the law of one price does not hold for all other items. Nevertheless, the, shoe top, the two shopping cars have the same price after consideration of the actual exchange rate. And since the price of the two shopping carts are identical, absolute purchasing power parity holds. Hence, it becomes clear that absolute purchasing power parity is not as restrictive as the law of one price. Of course, it will be the case that when law of one price holds for each and every good, then also absolute purchasing power parity holds. But it's not the other way around. It's not a necessity that the law of one price holds and only then the absolute purchasing power parity holds. In our example, it was a case that um, for like four out of five goods, the law of one price was did not hold. Nevertheless, absolute purchasing power parity holds. In case that absolute purchasing power parity holds, it has some implications for the real exchange rate. The real exchange rate is defined as nominal exchange rate times the foreign price level divided by the domestic price level. In case that absolute purchasing power parity holds, then it will be the case that the real exchange rate will take the value of 1. Let's switch to the third concept, relative purchasing power parity. In this concept, we'll not try to explain the exchange rate anymore, but we try to explain exchange rate changes. We try to explain exchange rate changes based on the inflation rate in the domestic economy and the inflation rate in the foreign economy. So we are trying to explain exchange rate changes based on the uh, inflation differential between the domestic economy and the foreign economy. But let's look at first at some causes for deviations from absolute purchasing power parity. We can sort these kind of causes into temporary causes or permanent causes. Temporary causes could be incomplete information. At some point in time, the households do not know what a good cost in the US, but they only learn over time. Furthermore, adjustments of prices will take some time because price lists are not changed immediately, but it will take some time until new price lists are printed. Therefore, goods prices are sticky because we have long-term goods contracts in place, while exchange rate can jump instantaneously when new information arrive at the foreign exchange market. So there is a mismatch between the um, adjustment process, which can take place related to exchange rates and good prices. Exchange rate can adjust much, much faster compared to goods prices, and therefore it might be the case that goods price adjustment needs some time, and they, this could be a temporary cause why absolute purchasing power parity does not hold in the short run. Permanent causes could be trade barriers, 
taxes and tariffs, quotas, transportation costs, active price differentiation of suppliers, that they are selling a good at a different price in the domestic economy compared to the foreign economy, or perceived differences in quality. In case that some permanent causes exist, this will hinder complete price adjustment even in the long run. Then absolute purchasing power parity will not hold even in the long run. So we have to adjust this relationship so that once more we get a relationship between the domestic price level, the nominal exchange rate and the foreign goods price, but not as stated in the absolute purchasing power parity theory, but there is a, another factor, an epsilon here, and this parameter epsilon reflects all the permanent causes that hinders a complete um, adjustment towards absolute purchasing power parity. Of course, when we solve equation 3 for the epsilon, then once more it will be the case that we get to equation 4, which indicates that this epsilon is nothing else than the real exchange rate. So when we put epsilon on the left hand side and the p on the right hand side, we get to equation 4. This parameter epsilon is of course equal to the real exchange rate. So in case that absolute purchasing power parity holds, then the real exchange rate will take the value of 1. Uh, this uh, is of course a case in case that there are no permanent causes. But in case that there are permanent causes, then uh, deviations from this absolute purchasing power parity can lead to a situation where the real exchange rate is smaller or larger than 1. In the textbooks, um, following steps are performed. Um, you can see the uh, real exchange rate given in equation 4. And in equation 5, you can see the same elements with the head above. And then in the textbook, frequently it is stated that from equation 4, we get for the change of the real exchange rate, equation 5. The big question is then, how, would, how do we get from equation 4 to equation 5? Let's perform some steps. How do we get from 4 to 5? In the first step, it makes sense and it, we have to make clear that this relationship holds in equation t, but also in equation t plus 1. Then we can take the natural logs of equation 4 prime and equation 4 double prime and we get to equation 5 prime and 5 double prime. So when we take the natural log on the left hand side, we have here the natural log of the real exchange rate. Then we have the natural log of the nominal exchange rate plus the natural log of the foreign price level minus the natural log of the domestic price level. When we now compute the difference between five pr double prime and five prime, when we subtract 5 prime from 5 double prime, we get on the left hand side the relative change in the real exchange rate, and on the right hand side the relative change in the nominal exchange rate plus the relative change in the um, domestic, uh, foreign price level minus the relative change in the domestic price level. And now we would like to abbreviate these kind of terms, like the natural log of one variable should be abbreviated by this head variable. And then, of course, we get to equation 5, where we have the relative change in the real exchange rate on the left-hand side. The relative change of the real exchange rate is equal to the relative change in the nominal exchange rate plus the relative change in the foreign price level minus the relative change in the domestic price level. Um, this uh, variables here, like p star hat, can also be 
labeled as the inflation rate in the foreign economy and p hat like the relative change in the domestic price level is equal to the inflation rate in the domestic economy so how do we get to this um, very important formula which explains relative purchasing power parity in a first step we have to make the assumptions that the permanent causes are constant we said that the permanent causes are uh, are in the end reflected by this parameter epsilon in case that the permanent causes are constant uh, epsilon does not change and hence the real exchange rate does not change the change in the real exchange rate is zero so epsilon hat is equal to zero we get to equation six now we put p star hat and p hat on the other hand side of the equation and then we get to equation seven in equation seven we have the change of the nominal exchange rate on the left hand side of the equation and the two inflation rates on the right hand side so on the right hand side of equation seven we find the inflation differential we can either write the relative purchasing power parity equation in the form of equation seven where we have e hat on the left hand side and then p hat and p star hat on the right hand side or we can write it in a more extensive form where you can see the relative change of the nominal exchange rate on the left hand side then the inflation rate of the domestic economy on the right hand side and we subtract also the inflation rate of the foreign economy relative purchasing power parity implies the relative change in the nominal exchange rate is equal to the inflation differential between Euroland and the US. The real exchange rate is constant. In case that the domestic price level increases by 10% while the foreign price level is constant, then the nominal exchange rate increases by 10%. This implies that countries which have problems with their internal price stability also have some problems with their external price stability. One country which definitely had problems with the internal price stability but also problems with the external price stability, uh, this is Italy. So the inflation rates in Italy have been very high and also the Italian lira was like a weak currency. Therefore, when we test relative purchasing power parity in the next step, I opted to use the relationship between Italy and Germany uh, in the past as a candidate for this relative purchasing power parity test. So in the first step, I would like to use a stylized example to derive the hypothesis with respect to the relative purchasing power parity. I create a table uh, where we have the inflation rate and the inflation differential in the second column. And we have the relative change in the exchange rate in the third column. Let's assume that in the year 1973, the inflation rate in Italy was 12%, while the inflation rate in Germany was 8%. In case that this formula 7, relative purchasing power parity, holds perfectly, it would be the case that the change in the exchange rate should be equal to 4%. So the exchange rate should increase by 4% we should observe a depreciation of the Italian lira. In the year 1974, let's assume that the inflation rate was equal to 25% in Italy, 5% in Germany, so that the uh, inflation differential 
was equal to 20%. In case that equation 7 holds perfectly, we would also assume that the exchange rate increases by 20%. In 75, let's assume that the inflation differential was equal to 6%. And in case that relative purchase and power parity holds, it should be the case that also um, the um, change in the exchange rate is equal to 6%. In 76, the inflation differential was even more pronounced. It was 16% inflation differential. So we would expect a 16% change in the exchange rate in case that purchasing power parity holds perfectly. I used this numerical example to come up with a scatter diagram. Once more, here in this column, you can see the inflation rate in Italy, inflation rate in Germany, the inflation differential, and the stylized example, the relative change in the exchange rate. Once more, this is only a stylized example to derive the hypothesis. I created a scatter diagram with the inflation differential on the horizontal axis and the relative change in the exchange rate on the vertical axis. The four dots here, they represent the green part of this Excel sheet. They represent the inflation differential in these four different years and the relative change in the exchange rate in these four different years. What about the y-intercept of a regression line which runs through these four points? The y-intercept would go through the origin. And what about the slope? The slope of this line is equal to plus one. So when we go one step to the right, in case that the inflation differential is 1% larger, we also should observe a 1% larger increase in the relative exchange rate. So the y-intercept should be equal to 0. The slope should be equal to 1. So when we test relative purchasing power parity, we now know our two pairs of hypotheses. Let's have a quick look at the regression equation. The dependent variable, this is the relative change in the exchange rate, which was displayed on the vertical axis of the scatter diagram. Then we have here the y-intercept and the slope. And the explanatory variable, this is the uh, inflation differential. In the end, we have here an error term. This error term is not the real exchange rate, it's the error term of this regression. We have two pairs of hypotheses. So null hypothesis with respect to the intercept is alpha is equal to zero, and the alternative hypothesis alpha is unequal to zero. The null hypothesis with respect to beta, the slope should be equal to 1, and the alternative hypothesis is that the slope is unequal to 1. We want to perform a two-sided test, and we always want to test on a 95% confidence level. So in this lecture, in my lecture, we always want to test on a 95% confidence level. We assume that we have enough observation so that the normal distribution is appropriate. And therefore, the critical t value in my lecture will be always equal to 2, or in case that you want to be precise, 1.96. So we don't have to memorize too much critical t values. We always assume 95% confidence level. We always have enough observations so that the normal distribution is valid and hence the critical t-values will be always equal to 2. Uh, once more, it is important to stress that this pair of hypotheses belongs together. So the null hypothesis belongs to the alternative hypothesis. 
it is not the case that th these two null hypotheses belong together. Students sometimes mix it up and they make like a, a kind of box around the first part and a box around the second part. This is not right. So like these two hypotheses belong together and these two hypotheses also belong together. We switch to Excel, we open the data file, and it is the case that in one uh, table, which is called data, you'll find some inflation data for Italy from the time period 1956 to the year 2017. So we have some inflation data for Italy. We also have some inflation data for Germany as well as the nominal exchange rate Italian Lira for one German mark. So more or less we have all the information we need to test relative purchasing power parity. I always recommend to come up with a kind of descriptive statistic uh, to create some graphs, to have a look at the data, to check what's going on in this data set. So let's try to plot the inflation rates. When we plot the inflation rates uh, over time, first we have to confess that this is yearly data. So data are on a yearly basis. So we put the year on the horizontal axis and the inflation rate on the vertical axis. Blue indicates Italy and orange indicates Germany. From 1956 to the beginning of the 70s, the inflation differential were not, was not very large. So Italy had more or less the same inflation rate as Germany. In some years, it is even the case that the blue line is below the orange line. So the inflation rate in Germany was larger than the inflation rate in Italy. But this changed in the 70s, where the inflation rate in Italy is much, much higher compared to the inflation rate in Germany. The blue line is always above the orange line. And it's also the case that the inflation rate in Italy is to some extent volatile. In the end, it is the case that the inflation rates once more converge. So when we look at the 90s and the 2000s, there is more or less no difference in the inflation rate anymore. After we have looked at the inflation rates and we have characterized the inflation differential, it makes sense to have a look at the nominal exchange rate. And here in the lower part, we plotted the development of the exchange rate Italian Lira for one German mark. It is also the case that here from 1956 until the beginning of the 70s, the relationship was pretty stable. So in this time period, it was not the case that the Italian Lira was a weak currency. But then in the second half of the 70s and the 80s until the beginning of the 90s, we can see a clear pass of the exchange rate. The nominal exchange rate is increasing, increasing, increasing. So we observe a depreciation of the Italian Lira. From uh, yeah, 99 onwards, it's a case that the exchange rate does not change anymore. The exchange rate Italian Lira for German mark is constant. This is due to the fact that both Italy and Germany, uh, they became, become member of the Euro area and therefore the exchange rate was fixed. So it seems to be the case that when we want to find empirical evidence in favor for relative purchasing power parity, this is an appropriate candidate because we have a pronounced inflation differential. Italy inflation rate is higher than the German inflation rate. And also the exchange rate increased, increased, increased during this time period. So when we look at this 
descriptive statistic, we would expect that relative purchasing power parity holds. Nevertheless, we have to think about what kind of years we are going to include in our regression. So I think it doesn't make sense to include the years from 1956 until the beginning of the 70s, because this is a Bretton Woods era. Exchange rates are fixed, and therefore we should not use this kind of concept to test relative purchasing power parity, because we want to explain changes in the nominal exchange rate. But when the nominal exchange rate is constant, uh, I think it doesn't make too much sense. So I would like to restrict the empirical analysis to a time frame where indeed we were observing an era of floating exchange rates. This also implies that the last few years we should not take into consideration because of the fact that the euro was introduced and we have no volatility in the nominal exchange rate anymore. Therefore, I opted for the following idea that we are just incorporating the time period from 1973 until 1995. We are incorporating the time period where we had a floating exchange rate system in place. So the inflation differential is given in column number G. We have the inflation differential. And in column number Y, we have the change in the nominal exchange rate. So the relative change in the nominal exchange rate is given in column number Y. When we click into these cells once more in column number G, we have the inflation differential. And in column number H, there is the relative difference between the exchange rate in 73 and the exchange rate in 72. So the relative change in the exchange rate. Uh, let's perform a regression analysis. I performed this in the lower part of this uh, Excel sheet. So here you can see the scatter diagram. Once more, I put the inflation differential on the horizontal axis, the relative change in the exchange rate on the vertical axis. And um, then you can see here the regression output. The fit of the regression is par far from perfect. So the R squared only takes a value of 0 0.13. So the, a lot of scattering is going on. The dots are far away from the regression line. Furthermore, it is also the case that the uh, regression line does not intersect with the vertical axis in the origin, but at the value of 5%. This is also estimated here. The intercept is about 5%. The slope of the curve is not equal to 1, but the slope is estimated to be 0.4. So we have, a, we have not a relationship 1 to 1 inflation differential and the relative change in the exchange rate. They don't behave as theory suggests, a 1 to 1 relationship but the relationship is only uh, 1 to 0.4. So this uh, is uh, very interesting because uh, we want to perform a regression analysis and also interpret the regression output. Uh, let's perform this regression analysis. It's pretty important that you only include the information in the yellow part of the spreadsheet. So when we look at the regression output, once more, you can see here the R squared, which is equal to 0.13. You can see the two coefficients, the intercept and the slope. And uh, this is the regression output. And I'm now switching back to the slides in order to come up with the interpretation of this regression output.
So we have performed this regression analysis and in the first step we can look at the confidence intervals. Let's interpret the confidence intervals. The claimed value of alpha is equal to zero is not included in the 95% confidence interval and therefore we reject the null hypothesis. Once more, look at this confidence interval. The lower bound is at 0.5, the upper bound at 9.3. So the zero is not included and we reject the null hypothesis. What about beta? beta should be equal to 1. Is a 1 included in this confidence interval? The lower bound is at minus 0.08, the upper bound at plus 0.91. So the 1 is not included in the confidence interval and therefore we also have to reject the hypothesis that beta is equal to 1. This is mentioned on slide 25. The claimed value of beta is equal to 1 is not included in the 95% confidence interval. We reject the null hypothesis. The conclusions are as follows. The empirical evidence is not in line with relative purchasing power parity. Beta is estimated to be plus 0.4, but it should be equal to plus 1. Both coefficients are significantly different from the claimed values on a 95% confidence level and therefore also this empirical evidence points into the direction that relative purchasing power parity does not hold. This is perhaps very surprising because we opted for one country pair, Italy and Germany, where we knew from the beginning that the inflation rate in Italy was higher than the inflation rate in Germany. And we also knew that the Italian lira was a weak currency. So we already opted for one country pair where it's very likely that relative purchasing power parity holds. But in the end, we had to confess that relative purchasing power parity does not hold. We can also confirm these kind of insights by looking at the estimated t-values and compare them with the critical t-values. So uh, t estimated t-value is computed in the following way. Estimated coefficient minus claimed value divided by standard error. And uh, in our hypothesis, we claim that alpha should be equal to zero. So the Estimated t value is equal to 4.91, the estimated coefficient minus the claimed value, which is equal to 0, divided by the standard error of 2.12. So in the end, we get a t value estimated to be equal to 2.32. With respect to beta, the estimated t value by Excel is not right and we have to adjust it. So we claimed in our hypothesis that beta is equal to 1. So we have to subtract a 1 here and the appropriate estimated t value is equal to a negative 2.46. Now it is a time to compare the estimated values with the critical values. So the estimated t value with respect to alpha was equal to 2.32. So it's uh, here and hence the conclusion is reject the null hypothesis because of the fact that this border here was crossed. With respect to beta, the appropriate estimated t value is equal to minus 2.46. So also the lower border was crossed. We are here in this area. And hence the conclusion is to reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, it becomes clear that the conclusions based on the t test, they just confirm our conclusions made by looking at the confidence intervals. This always has to be the case. So, so the t-test and the 
a confidence interval, they have to guide us into the same direction. Okay, let's have a look at the Big Mac index. The Big Mac index is a table of Big Mac prices in different countries. It was developed by the British magazine The Economist. And you have here like one Big Mac table given on this kind of slide. So now more or less you know what it's all about. It's about comparing Big Mac prices in different countries. We want to find the equilibrium exchange rate. And in the last column, we would like to compute the degree of under or over valuation. Let's go through the slides. So a popular way of studying purchasing power parity is to use the Big Mac index. It is de developed by the British magazine, The Economist. Why is it uh, nice to study a Big Macs for the analysis of PPP? Uh, it is interesting that the Big Mac seems to be a very homogeneous good. It is uh, present in a, a lot of different countries around the world and we have no differences in quality. Furthermore, the preferences are pretty much alike around the globe. So the kids like it, the parents don't like it. Um, therefore, the preferences on the side of the consumer are the same. Of course, the Big Mac is not an internationally traded good. So you cannot buy a Big Mac where it is cheap, for example, in China and sell it in the streets of New York. This, of course, is impossible because nobody will buy a cold Big Mac produced in China in the streets of New York. This is impossible. So international trade does not take place in this kind of uh, in this kind of good. But uh, we can interpret the Big Mac price as a kind of producer price index, because the we use some factors of production to create a Big Mac, and we use the same factors of production to create tradable goods. So, for example, when we um, uh, sell and produce a Big Mac, we need land for the restaurant, we need capital because we need some machineries within the store and we also need some waiters and which are, which are serving within the restaurant. So the price of land, capital and labor will in the end influence the Big Mac price. But the same is true for some goods which are internationally traded, which can be exported and imported. And therefore, we can regard the Big Mac as a kind of producer price index. So I don't regard the Big Mac price as an example for the law of one price. But I think that this analysis of the Big Mac table is much more related to uh, absolute purchasing power parity or relative purchasing power parity, because I regard the Big Mac price as a price index. I would like to briefly guide you through the table by looking at one example, by looking at the example of Denmark. You can see here that Denmark is sold in Denmark for 28 Danish krona in US dollars. It's uh, 595 US dollars. The implied PPP is 7.84. The actual exchange rate is at 4.7. And the degree of overvaluation is 67%. How is this stuff computed? It's computed in the following way. So a Big Mac sells in Denmark at 28 Danish krona and a Big Mac sells in the US at uh, $3.57. One important and somewhat implicit assumption is that the goods prices do not adjust, the goods prices stay constant. And when we make this assumption, then we can compute the equilibrium exchange rate. 
the equilibrium exchange rate is given by this uh, relationship here when we solve for F for the exchange rate e then we have computed the equilibrium exchange rate where the law of one price holds so let's put the dollar price on the right hand side when we divide the price in denmark by the price in the us we get the equilibrium exchange rate of 7.84 Danish krona per US dollar. You find the value of 7.84 Danish krona in this column here, implied PPP of the dollar. So here is the equilibrium exchange rate and this column is the equilibrium exchange rate. In a next step, we can compute the relative difference between the equilibrium exchange rate and the actual exchange rate. The actual exchange rate in July 2008 was equal to 4.70 Danish krona per US dollar. So we have to compare the actual exchange rate with the equilibrium exchange rate and compute the overvaluation by using the following formula. The equilibrium exchange rate minus the actual exchange rate divided by the actual exchange rate. So this formula is very important that you remember it. It's equilibrium minus actual divided by actual. So here we have the equilibrium exchange rate given by the ratio of the two Big Mac prices in Denmark and in the US. And we subtract the actual exchange rate divided by the actual exchange rate we get to this value here, which gives us the uh, degree of overvaluation uh, of the Danish krona. To some extent, this Big Mac uh, table promises to compute an equilibrium exchange rate. And the idea is that over time, the exchange rate will develop towards this equilibrium value. In this chapter, we had a look at four different concepts. The first concept was the law of one price, where we looked at the goods prices in the home country and the foreign country of one specific good. In the absolute purchasing power parity part, it is the case that we were looking at the price of a basket of goods. So we created a basket of goods by visiting a German supermarket and an American supermarket. And we uh, put the very same um, numbers of goods in our shopping cart. So we created a basket of goods. And uh, in case that absolute purchasing power parity holds, the price of the basket of goods in Germany and the price of the basket of goods in the US should be the same. When it comes to relative purchasing power parity, we don't talk about goods prices and the exchange rate anymore. We talk about the inflation rates and the inflation differential and the relative change in the nominal exchange rate. We use the example of the Italy and Germany as well as the Italian Lira German Mark exchange rate to test relative purchasing power parity. And in the end, it was the case that we had to reject relative purchasing power parity based on these empirical results. In the end, we had a look at the Big Mac index. You can either interpret the Big Mac index as a special form of the law of one price because we are comparing the prices of Big Macs. But you can also regard the Big Mac index as a kind of test for absolute purchasing power parity because we could also regard the Big Mac price as a kind of producer price index. We are at the end of this lecture. Thank you very much for watching this video. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye bye.